Christina Alabado, who you are playing Dot in the Pasadena Playhouse production of Stephen Sondheim and James, Le James Lapine's Sunday in the Park with George. Yeah. And I want to start by, and I will bring this song up a few times in our interview because it is one of the most important songs I think St Sondheim wrote, which was Move On. Mm. And as Dot um, in Move On, you sing, anything you do, let it come from you, then it will be new, show us more to, give us more to see. Mm -hmm. How does playing this role allow you to see more of yourself as an actor and a singer? Oh, that's such a good question. I was just speaking about this with somebody else. You know, this is my first time um, in my 15 years of doing this professionally, of being able to tackle Sondheim, um, which didn't come out of not wanting to, but rather just the way that my career has gone. It just has never taken me in the path of Sondheim. Also, I am a Mexican Lebanese woman. And I think that in the last five years, maybe is the first time that we've seen different types being cast in these beautiful, huge Sondheim shows that possibly didn't have that kind of accessibility for somebody like me in the past. So I feel very privileged and honored to be tackling this work. And specifically as an artist, you know, I didn't know Sunday in the Park very well. I didn't know Dot very well. So every night that I do it, every time I sing those lyrics in particular and move on, I learn and find something new in them for me as an artist. I feel like as I've been talking about this show and being here in Los Angeles and doing this piece of true art on stage, I feel like I am changing as an actor, as a singer, as a performer, with the incredible messages that Dot is trying to relay to George throughout the piece and the messages that Sondheim and, Lep and James Lapine are trying to give us as the artists interpreting them. Um, it's been very moving for me and I'm so excited to do the show. I can't wait to go back tonight to do it again, to find more new things in it and to feel all of that being given to me as an artist as well. And I would assume when you're tackling the work of Stephen Sondheim, it's different than tackling Mean Girls. Yes. Not to belittle Mean Girls, but it, they don't aspire to be the same thing at all. Not at all. And I think that's what's great about musical theater is we have so many different types of musicals and so many different types of genres. And as the years have gone by, the way that writers are writing now, you know, I think that Sondheim is obviously, as we all know, a complete genius in the art form, possibly the greatest musical theater composer creator that has and will ever have lived and touched all of us with his incredible work and I think tackling this is completely different than tackling Mean Girls than is tackling you know my other body of work I did like American Idiot and Spring Awakening all these different types of musicals and there is a density of this material um, that requires a different piece of you. You have to give yourself to it differently. Also, my brain has to activate in a certain way. You know, those words in that my opening number, um, Sunday, they fly out of you and they're so specific and exactly what he wanted. And so honoring that takes a lot of um, focus as an actor as well. Not that I'm not focusing in those other shows, but this is a little bit of a different muscle. <laughs> In, in his books, you know, Finishing the Hat, yes. you know, he he writes about patter songs being easier to do than big lyrical songs mm. that he's written. And you have incredibly fast patter that, yes. that introduces you to the, to the audience in the show. Is he right? Are patter songs actually a lot easier than they might appear to be to somebody who isn't a trained singer? Well, you know, I think there is sort of an element of fight like it's almost like fight or flight like it's either going to come out or it's not <laughs> and um and you know what's funny about that song is I think that also because it's a patter song because you know it's fast it's a lot of words I spent a lot of time even pre-starting rehearsals really you know digesting the language and understanding what it is and I think there is an element of, of I think I agree with him in the sense that like that's the way we think, right? Patter songs almost is the way if you in finishing the hat, this um that book I've which I've read, I love the section about this song in particular, Sunday, where he basically, you know, he he got like a monologue from James of all of the thoughts that Dot has running in her head. And then Sondheim was able to translate that into a music, um, into a piece of music and lyrics. And I think that in that way, it may everything that comes out of her, out of her in that song makes the utmost sense as to the situation that we're that we're given and like you said it's such a great way for the audience to come into the piece it allows the audience to laugh it allows the audience and makes them lean in and listen like this is the ride you're about to go on over the next two and a half hours so um that's my favorite song to do of the show because it also gets me christina really in with dot quickly i'm like oh she's here i'm here let's do this we're going 
Now, for those who may not have seen any previous productions of Sunday in the Park with George, you actually play two characters. You play Dot, who is the muse in the first act, and you play Marie, who is the grandmother in the second act. Yep. And as an actor, did you approach, did you create Dot in your mind first, and did that inform who Marie was, or did you work the other way around? I did Dot first, for sure. You know, I focused on, the, the two acts are so different. It's almost like two, like, I mean, they beautifully are come together, but it's such an interesting experience as an actor to go from being in the 1800s and playing this, you know, like you said, vivacious lover of this artist to then transitioning in the second act into the 1980s, playing a 98 year old woman who is the daughter of the character I played in the first act. And um, I definitely focused on Dot first. I think I tackled the first act first in general because I felt that that had the most, um, again, dense language and and also it really sets us up and it needs to propel us into the second act we really need to care about these characters and understand what's happening for us to really move into the 1980s in the second act really understanding the lineage and and then in turn when we hit move on and we've combined the worlds there it is this beautiful combination of legacy and family and i mean it's it's so powerful to me so i definitely started with dot first marie was second on my list but Marie, even in my auditions, I just connected with, you know, it's very rare that somebody like my age gets to tackle a 98 year old woman, um, talking to her grandson about life and wisdom. And, um, I've always felt, you know, it almost feel like it was in me somewhere. So Marie kind of found her way and Sarna, our director obviously helped me craft that. And, um, you know, I think it's been fun. Sarna's interpretation of Marie, um, is, you know, she's from Charleston. So we, I get to use this kind of like upper, you know, accent of, um, the North Carolina, the Carolinas, which is really fun. And it allows it to be very different from Dot. Yeah. It's interesting because I looked at an interview that Sarna gave, uh, to Interval New York in 2017, and she was talking about the arc of the show was about, quote, the mistress is the muse in act one, and she becomes the teacher in act two. Yeah. And I'm wondering if if you had any conversations with Sarna about that way of looking at these two women that you're playing. Yeah, you know, maybe not in particular like that. Um, but but I think that one of the things that we, me and Sarna and Graham, who plays George, have always been in conversation about is what do I get? What does Dot get from George? What does George learn from Dot? What does Marie teach George act two? What does George teach Marie in turn even still? And how are all of these people still helping each other? You know, Dot and George have a harder time because they both want different things that they know and Dot knows deep down she can never get from him and he can never get from her. And so in turn is why it's such a heartbreak that we, how the, the act, you know, ends up and what ends up happening for George and Dot. Um, but yes, as Marie, me and Sarna have had many conversations about the wisdom in which Marie de, like gives to second act George and where that comes from. And it comes from, you know, the song children in art really puts us into this idea that like, all we can do is learn the lessons from the people that we have passed, that have passed through us, that have come through us. And how to interpret that is our job as the artist, um, which is such a powerful message for us as human beings and personally me in particular as, as an artist. I'm glad you brought up Children in Art because Beyond Move On, Children in Art, I think is one of the most important songs in the show as is Finishing the Hat. And I don't know if you know the history of the show, but Finishing the Hat didn't come into the show until its third week of performances at Playwrights Horizon Off-Broadway. Oh, wow, and, I didn't know that. And Children and Art didn't come in to the show until two weeks before opening night. Oh my gosh, I did not know that. Oh, wow. Yeah. It would be so different without them. Well, exactly. <laughs> what do you think the difference would be without those two songs? Oh my gosh. I mean, well, talk about iconic musical theater legacy songs like to the fact that that but that's it's so funny you bring that up I've done many new musicals in New York and that is how it goes every once in a while they'll be like let's try this one and then you're like wait that's the greatest thing I've ever heard how was that not here but that's the part of the process right like you can't really know where you got to go until you start seeing it which is why previews in particular in New York that can last upwards of four to six weeks are so vitally important for musicals because it allows the creators to really see what they need um the show without finishing the hat and children in art, I mean, it wouldn't be the same, right? Those songs are such a key into 
the complexity that is being an artist, especially finishing the hat. I mean, children in art, they're very different, obviously. Children in art, though, is, I think, the fact that we get there in the sec, after you kind of watch this crazy number about, you know, putting it together, which is the number right before children in art, is this long, huge number about what it means to be an artist and all the different and very odd ways that you have to sort of work through that as a business owner as well. I find that song to be very interesting. Um, and then we, we land on this song and my God, like, I think it's a breath, right? You, you saw the show, it goes, go, 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 goes. And then we get this lift here where it's like, I don't know. Wow. I can't imagine the show without those two songs. <laughs> well, it's interesting because finishing the hat is really where we get to understand what's going on in George's mind and what's going on in George's heart. Right. And in, and in children and art, I feel like we get the the reason why we still care a hundred years later um, about about these two these two pairs of characters. Yes. I think it's truly the emotional heart until move on, which to me is the masterpiece of the show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I, I I couldn't imagine them imagine those shows without them. Um, but apparently the audience. I was reading James Lapine book on how he and Stephen Sondheim created Sunday in the Park with George, and he mentioned that with the the audience who got to hear that finishing the hat for the first time that it was just electric in that small off broadway audience at playwrights horizon oh my god i can't imagine i, I mean ooh that's a give me chills actually <laughs> be in the room at that time wow now i i saw the original production in the 80s i've mm -hmm. seen this is this is the fifth or sixth production of sunday in the park with george that i've seen it also happens to be the first major production um, certainly one on Broadway that was directed by a woman in Sarna Lapine, who for audiences who might be watching our video is the niece of James Lapine, not the daughter yes. of, of James Lapine. But I'm wondering if you think that her approach might be different, given that that a woman is, as, as she described, the muse in the first half and, and the mentor, the teacher in the second half. Do you think her approach coming at it as a woman may have brought different resonance, different tones, different ways of depicting and telling the story? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think what's beautiful about reviving shows or trying them in different ways is that, you know, the show originally was interpreted so specifically by these two people that created it, right? And so it's like, obviously, that's the the beautiful lesson that we all get to take when we revive or try shows again later on is that this gift was given to us, which is the original interpretation and where all of that came into. Now, it also involves Bernadette and Mandy, like everything about the original was crafted with this group of people so specifically. So then our job as interpretive artists, because we didn't create it, is to find our way and new ways into it also many years later. How is the world different? How are we different? How do we interpret art differently? So I think, you know, my favorite thing about watching shows that have existed is that they're different. It can be minute. And obviously we're saying the same words, but there can be ways that we breathe life into it that are different. Doesn't make it better. Doesn't make it worse. It just is different, which I think is incredibly beautiful because that's that will last the test of time. I can't wait to see what Sunday in the Park with George interpreted in 20. 50 would be, you know, it's going to be completely different. So, um, but as far as Sarna being a woman and the, you know, she has, she saw the original when she was eight years old. She talks about that. She talks about how deeply important this piece is to her, to her family, um, but really her personally. And so, you know, I think you would have to ask her like her womanliness, if it really, you know, makes a difference in here, but as a woman, with a woman director, which I don't get to, you know, do very often either. Um, we've had incredibly deep, wonderful conversations. Again, me, Sarna, and Graham have really been so connected in this process. Um, I feel very fortunate that Graham is my George. We are very connected. And the three of us, you know, the conversations we've had about the the depths and intricacies of the Dot and George's relationship, that it's much more complicated than that George isn't emotionally available and Dot needs more. It's so layered. And we weren't afraid to lean into the connection between George and Dot. I think that's something that Graham and I and Sarna have loved kind of messing with is like, they really do love each other. And we're not afraid to show that to the audience in ways that may feel subtle, but like for us, we charge it because they had to have had a charge, right? Like for it to happen that way. And so I think that's been a really cool thing that we have found together. 
um, the three of us. And, you know, I think that Sarna interpreting it through the eyes and lens of a woman um, has given us wonderful new ways to see things and try things. You know, there's a theme that's running through this. You know, she's given you new things to see. You know, you, you are new interpreters. You get to do things in a new way. I mean, you're living out what Sondheim wrote, aren't you? Right, right. Again, chills. Again, because that's all we can do as artists. Like, And I'm sure that, you know, again, we look at this beautiful work that they've already done and they had their ways of doing it. And we just get to interpret it and see what works and what doesn't in new ways. So I think I'm just very fortunate for that. I read an interview that Bernadette Peters gave many, many years after Sunday in the Park with George, and she was talking about singing Move On, and she said that it, quote, got to be like meditating. It was so healing and uplifting. What do you experience when you get to that moment in the show and have completed that song? Yeah, you know, it's something so, the first couple of times we sang it, I, I, I could not help but like sob through it because it's just this cathartic it's oddly a release, but it's a release in the most peaceful way, which is why the song to me is so incredible. The wisdom that is given to us in those lyrics and that Doc gets to impart on George is so moving. And so what all of us desperately need to hear as actors, artists, creators. And so it's almost like, I agree, a meditation, a self-healing moment for me personally, for Dot, for George, for Graham, for our company, for the audience. And it feels like this big moment of we're all, this is what we all need to hear right now, including me. So I find it to be very healing in that way for me as well. And also like Dot goes through a lot in the show. The show is hard for Dot. I hurt as Dot. And so it's this way to finally also connect with George and forgive him. So there's so much going on in that beautiful song. Um, you know, I think that I know how important that song is to people. So as the run continues, I feel like I'll also get to settle into trusting that, you know, again, we, through previews, we're changing things and blocking all the way until we open. So, you know, as for those of you that don't know what that feels like as an actor, you're like, oh, I have to move somewhere different tonight. And you get a little like, you know, so now that it's set, we can settle into really feeling this out. And um, I do agree. It is one of the most cathartic in a calm way, in an entrusting way, moments I've ever had on stage. You make me want to get a ticket for closing night to see what that journey has been like for you. Yes, come. I mean, that's what's so exciting about having time to do the show. And like, you know, again, the different biggest difference between regional theater and, you know, doing a show in New York is that it's a tr more truncated process. It's faster. And so what's cool about anyone coming to the run or anyone that wants to come back is that you're going to see it differently when you come back, because all of us as a company, we feel like we're just starting to find it. You know, we've arrived to this opening night, the celebration of all the work we've done, and now it continues, which is so exciting to me and why I am absolutely thrilled to be doing this for the next four weeks. The history of this show is rather interesting because reviews were mixed. Um, it was nominated for a lot of Tony Awards. It lost most of them to La Caja Full. Um, yet this musical gets produced more often and on a more regular basis than La Caja Full. Mm. What do you think audiences know about this musical now that perhaps audiences didn't understand when it debuted in 1984? Great question. I think... You know, I think that as a people, <laughs> I think sometimes we're afraid of change and we're afraid of of different, like trying something new. I think that in a way, obviously I wasn't around when this was created, um, but I think that if we look at musical theater at that time, even when I read this piece for the first time, I watched the PBS special when I got cast because I hadn't seen it. I didn't know very much about it. And I was like, this is kind of, this is different for that time. It was trying a lot of different things. Yes, I know the reviews were mixed and, but it was, he was trying something new. And what I love about the piece is that it wasn't afraid to do something like write a 20 minute number in act two that is going, that is in the 1980s where you're like, what has happened? We were just, and to me, it's the most genius work, but it takes an, an element of like leaning into that there are some oddities to the piece, not in a negative way, but rather in a non 
normal, I suppose, way for most musicals. You know, there's not a big opening number. There's not a big closing, you know, or there's not a big opening act to everything they did was for the piece itself, not for the audience in a way, or at least that's how I see it. Um, but it is for them in the larger scope. Um, but I suppose that it must have been challenging for some people to watch a musical like this where it's just not, I'm not sure. I mean, how did you feel about it? If you saw it, like, did it did it kind of defy what you expected and that a musical could be, I suppose? No, but but my experience was very different. See, when I when I when I saw Sweeney Todd, I felt like I had found religion. Oh. That show was everything to me. So I was seeking out everything Sondheim as fast as I could. Mm. So, and I saw La Caja Full and I did not like it. It took me, it took a revival year, many decades later for me to go, I see why that show works. I see why people like that show. Mm -hmm. I still prefer Sunday in the Park with George. It just resonates with me and what I want to hear more than, you know, a traditional, you know, big Broadway show songs might. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think time has been kind to both shows, at least from my perspective. Yes, yes. And it seems that, again, as Sunday in the Park has, like, stood the test of time, as all of the work, you know, of his work has, I think that, you know, again, new people are finding it. And I think as we continue on and our world gets more complicated and busy and all that stuff, this show reminds us why we do this. And it is one of, I think, the greatest lessons that a musical could ever give to us. I, I, I really feel that way. And I've worked on a lot of shows and I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of musicals and I've never been so taken aback by something that has truly, I think, changed me. Um, and I really mean that, like as, as a person and as an actor interpreting this work. What's what provides the biggest challenge for you during doing a workshop of a musical like The Devil Wears Prada that nobody has seen or heard before or entering into a show that has been beloved for as long as it has? They're two very different things, right? You know, I think that um, being a New York based actor, which I am, we I spend a lot of my time developing new musicals, probably more time than anything. So doing um, labs and workshops, like you said, of Devil Wears Prada, of new musicals coming and um, it's a different thing. Uh, really, because as you do this longer, uh, I also don't have expectations. When I do a lab or workshop, most of the time it's a casting director that says, hey, hey, they need to trust who's working on it and who's workshopping it. So you don't really audition for those. You don't know if you're perfectly right for them. You just work, you help the team. So it feels like a very collaborative process. High stakes. There's lots of important people there. You want to take it to the next level if it's used, it's different. But interpreting work, especially like this, that doesn't get done often in Los Angeles, uh, I've heard. Um, and also like the fact that we got to get to do it with the full orchestration. Like there was a lot around this production that felt very important and very um, like a great opportunity for um, the piece, for me as an actor, for us as a company, um, for Pasadena Playhouse, for all the things, you know what I mean? And um, there's, a, there's a pressure in that, that I think, as an actor, and again, I've been doing this for a long time now, it fires me up. It makes me, I want to be able to give what I can of myself to this piece, to the audience, to Pasadena, to Los Angeles, to my fellow company members. And I take that as an incredible opportunity rather than um, a daunting task, um, which I think is why I'm still doing this and not <laughs> have it moved on to something else. Um, but, you know, new musicals are totally different. They feel almost oddly less pressurized but more in in a way but it's also just starting on those so there's time for them and things so they're just very different well I do want to ask you about one new musical that you did because I am a massive fan of another genius a gentleman we used to have on this planet called David Bowie um and I I got to see Lazarus when there was a streaming opportunity to see it which I was so grateful because it has not been you know performed all that much but what was the process like of working with Dave in and around David Bowie on that project? Yeah, man, that's a, for a whole other, you know, hour of talking, but, it, but in short, it was one of the most unexpected, incredible things I've ever gotten to do in my life. And never when I was, you know, thinking I was going to do musical theater for a living, did I think I would get to work with a legend like that and work closely with him. And I, I mean, I, 
the whole thing from start to finish was magical and zany and so unexpected and also just so cool. Like, I mean, I, you know, I, I started my career doing more rock musicals. I did spring awakening. I did the green day musical. So I was in that world. Um, but then being able to sort of find this with David and with the creators of Lazarus with Evo, our director, I mean, what an opportunity and, and memories that I will never, ever lose because it was, and he was such a good, he's such a good person and he loves musicals, which I didn't really know about David until we were working on it. And he just, um, he was so grateful that we were all doing it. And he was so, it was everything he wanted was to write a musical and to have it performed. And so it was just really important to him and in turn important to us, um, though we were not privy to um, him being ill in any way. And his death came as a complete shock. Um, we recorded the cast album on the day that he died. Uh, he was going to be like, we didn't know. So it was, it was a very interesting time. Um, very grateful. I hold it very dear to my heart um, in many, many ways. Yeah. And I can't imagine what it be, must be like to be sitting there, you know, saying David. Right. Right. I mean, David. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I've had the flip side of that equation, which is I got to know Steve, um, you know, Sondheim. as in Sondheim. Yes. Oh. I went to his, his, you know, townhouse multiple times. I was his guest at multiple events. I hosted him here once. And in fact, it was hosting him here, which is how I got to meet him and got to know him, which was amazing. And, and I still pinch myself that I can call him, that I could call him Steve. Yes. I just never, those are, were, that was just a, a part of language I never thought was going to be remotely conceivable. That's incredible that you knew him. I had never met Stephen Sondheim. I would I obviously know he was such a like beautiful giving person and artist to other artists in particular. And, um, you know, I have never passed crossed paths with him, but many of my friends and collaborators have, and they say nothing but incredible things about who he was and all of the gifts that he continues to give us for a lifetime. Well, he was a teacher and, you know, it's no wonder they could write a character like Marie who can serve as a teacher for all of us. Exactly. Exactly. So so I want to finish up our time, Christina, by reverting one last time to move on because it has my favorite lyric that I think has ever been written in that, which was, I chosen my world was shaken. So what? The choice may have been mistaken. The choosing was not. That's my favorite lyric of the whole show. Yeah, it's my favorite lyric of everything he's ever written and probably everything anybody else has ever written, to be Truly. honest with you. Um, and it's something that I try to apply to all aspects of, of my life. And clearly that line, that lyric resonates with you. But does does that thinking play a part in how you move through your career and your life, not only during Sunday in the Park with George, but for whatever else comes after that? Mm, yes. I mean, the choice may have been mistaken. The choosing was not. I mean, talk about if anyone wants to know what it's like to be an actor, it's that because we have to make choices and it's everything that we do feels like a little leap of faith. And, you know, people always ask, God, it must be hard to be an actor or a creator because you never know what's coming. You never know what's happening. Like, it's like, and I find that to be why my life is so rich and full of experiences and emotion in a way that I find I could never be the person I am without having d doing this. And what we do is complicated. It can be very, very challenging. It can be very, very hard. And it can also be really complicated to find levity in a business that sometimes can feel really deep and difficult. And I think that lesson in itself is why I love what I do so much is because you do just have to choose. You have to take a leap. You have to jump and you may end up where the choice may have been mistaken. You could have maybe made what could be interpreted as the wrong choice, but doing it is what was the right choice, which is all we can do is just keep going. Um, and I think that Oh, I, that will always stay with me moving forward after this show, because that's one of the hardest things I, I find as an actor is choosing and making choices and not being afraid of that. And I think Dot is trying to teach us and teach George in that moment that that will always be and actually just doing it and choosing and going forward is all we can do. We can't know if it's right or wrong, but all we can do is do it. So huge lesson to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 I, 
get moved every time I think of that lyric. Same. Um, and your performance of it on opening night was was gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your time in Pasadena with Sunday in the Park with George. And I'm going to see if I can get to that last show. Oh, yes, I hope you can. I hope it's going to be a wonderful four weeks. And we're very happy to be here. And I hope everybody comes and sees it and finds their own lesson in it. I feel like there's so many, you know, I, I did a video with the cast. I asked what everyone's favorite lyric is. Everyone's is different because there's so many incredible lessons and nuggets in the show. So I always say, you know, it's a good one to see twice because you'll see it like and then you'll hear it differently the next time you see it. All right. But that leads me to a question that I have to ask you. Did anybody say my favorite lyric is that's the puddle where the poodle took a piddle? <laughs> no, but that's such a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Who comes up with that? I mean, that's just the brilliance, right? Brilliant. And so creative and so fun, right? It's, I think sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. And in a work that is serious, my God, there's so much fun in it. There is. Well, yeah. I hope you have a lot of fun in, in the next four weeks. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. You too.